Uh, what? Welcome to the next se session. This is on substantive equality and minority rights. This is going to be another stimulating discussion, which really joins issue with a lot of questions uh, and issues that were uh, telegraphed or or discussed head on in the last in the last session. Um, unfortunately, Anna Maria and Anajor, who's on our program, was unable to make it. She she had a health issue. We wish her. Uh, speedy recovery, and we miss her. Uh, but we are very, very fortunate now to have Caitlin Salvino, who is a uh, a junior fellow at Massey and uh, a, a legal scholar and a philosophy scholar, uh, and is going to talk to us about uh, minority rights, in particular, and the impact of Section 33 uh, on minority rights. Caitlin. Hi, everyone. I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to be put up. I think as one of the youngest speakers, it makes sense that I have a PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> um, but I want to start off first by thanking both Peter and Natalie for inviting me to speak at this conference. Um, I did both my master's and my PhD uh, thesis that I will be defending this summer on the notwithstanding clause. And so almost everyone who's spoken thus far, I've read your work. I've cited it. I've been really, really interested in it and grappled with it for a long time. And so I, I feel very grateful to be able to um, not only attend, but be able to participate and contribute to the discussion. And so um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the notwithstanding clause in the context of minority rights. And so what I argue, and this is the focus of my master's thesis, is that um, due to the unique legislative design of Section 33 and the low uptake of the Notwithstanding Clause thus far, the academic scholarship has primarily focused on the role of the Notwithstanding Clause in, within the relationship between the courts and the legislature. And so I argue that thus far there's a paucity or a gap in the literature to examine the ways in which minority rights are uniquely vulnerable to the structural design of the Notwithstanding Clause. And so I examined the structural design of the Notwithstanding Clause and particularly the safeguard is safeguards embedded within it to argue that minority rights are uniquely vulnerable. And so in the past presentation and in presentations yesterday, there was, a, there was um, reference to, well, the notwithstanding clause, if it's used in a tyrannical way, they will be voted out. And my question is, when it's used in a tyrannical way in reference to minority rights, does that safeguard mechanism work in the same way? And so the structure of what I'll be talking about today, I'm going to start with um, potentially the most controversial aspect of this whole conference is how many times the notwithstanding clause has actually been used. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the academic commentary thus far. Um, this will include the commentary before this conference. Um, and I think that some of the people that I'll be quoting, their, their views may have changed. Um, and then I'll get into um, my argument where I break down the, the structure, structure of the notwithstanding clause in the context of minority rights. And so just to begin, um, thus far, a lot of the literature contains inconsistencies in how many times the notwithstanding clause is used. And um, there have been catalogs that have been developed, both by Kahana, Rousseau, and Cote, that include a full comprehensive catalog of the uses. And in a paper that I recently published, I tried to update the, that to include a full comprehensive catalog of all the uses up until 2022. Um, for me, I have identified 24 total pieces of legislation that were tabled that included the notwithstanding clause, but that does not mean that they um, were promulgated and effective. And so the way that I split up the uses is that um, bills that were tabled that included the notwithstanding clause, bills that were promulgated but not effective, and then bills that were promulgated and effective. And of those, there's 16, 15 in Quebec, and one very recently in Ontario. Um, 10 of these acts have been um, renewed. Um, and currently, there are seven active notwithstanding clause invocations, um, not including Quebec's Bill 96, which is currently under consideration. Um, I also include a timeline of the notwithstanding clause uses. And I think that um, this is one of the reasons that I became really interested as a younger um, academic in the notwithstanding clause was in response to um, Ford's use of the notwithstanding clause in uh, 2018 with the municipal elections. And so immediately following the um, charter's uh, entrenchment, um, the notwithstanding clause was used a lot, 15 times also in an ominous use by Quebec, um, but all of those 15 times were by Quebec. In the 20 years following, there was much less use. This does not include the renewals, of course. But then since 2018, there has been a rise in the use of notwithstanding clause, 
not only from um, Quebec, but we're seeing from provinces that have never used the notwithstanding clause before. And so Ontario has used it um, twice, only once successfully for the first time, and also New Brunswick used it for the first time as well, um, but that was ultimately not passed. Um, in terms of the um, successful and attempted uses, 19 of those uses were preemptive, five of them were responsive, and eight of them were broad rights, where they applied to all of the possible sections of the charter that they could apply to, um, as opposed to targeted. Um, I've included on the slide some thematic um, reasons that the notwithstanding clause was applied. Um, and also at the bottom, I also list um, ways in which the notwithstanding clause was applied in the context of minority rights. And so um, in Alberta, it was used to limit compensation, it was tabled to be used to limit compensation for individuals living with disabilities who had been sterilized, um, but was withdrawn. The Marriage Amendment Act was in Alberta where they used it to, in a symbolic manner, to affirm that, same, that uh, marriage should be between opposite sex couples. It was ultimately ultra vires. Um, we have the Lacity of the State Act, which has been uh, spoken about at length in the last section, session. Um, and also there has been, as spoken about in earlier um, sessions, that um, there is an argument that the notwithstanding clause has been used in support of minority rights. But what I would argue is that we really need to look at where those were used. So in Yukon, for example, um, they included the notwithstanding clause in a bill around um, membership of indigenous uh, individuals on a um, government um, decision-making body. However, that was at the early stages of the charter. And even when you look at the Hansard, they were saying that they didn't know if they needed to use it, and ultimately they didn't. Um, same within Saskatchewan with the School Choice Protection Act. Um, the notwithstanding clause was tabled, received royal assent, was never actually promulgated because they were able to get um, a stay of the effect of the uh, Queen's Court bench decision um, pending the Court of Appeal decision, then ultimately um, it was not, not needed um, in the end. And so I've included on the slides quotes from many people in this room. <laughs> and this is the academic commentary um, that was on the notwithstanding clause thus far that really focused on the relationship between the courts and the legislatures and how the notwithstanding clause fits within our understanding of Canada's constitutional democracy. Um, and you know, this debate between weak form, strong form, and uh, judicial review, and also the common, co commonwealth constitutional model. Um, I won't uh, read out the uh, quotes on sl the slides, but um, there are also has been significant amounts of suggested reforms to the notwithstanding clause. Um, this includes restricting the notwithstanding clause to responsive uses only. Um, it includes ending the omnibus uh, or blanket application of the notwithstanding clause. It includes requiring um, invocations every time that there's an election, so that there's a reconsideration immediately as opposed to on five-year cycles. Um, and even um, Scott Reed, um, who is not here at this conference, suggested that the notwithstanding clause should only be used when there are public referendums. And so this really, um, I, I will now turn to my argument or what I propose around the notwithstanding clause. And I really want to um, first take a step back to when the notwithstanding clause was first included in the charter. And Jean Chrétien, when he was introducing the notwithstanding clause, introduced it as a safety valve, which is unlikely to ever be used except for non-controversial circumstances. And then almost 40 years later, in response to when Doug Ford used it in um, the context of the Toronto municipal election, Jean Chrétien, Roy Romanow, and Roy McMurdy who were also involved in the drafting of the notwithstanding clause released a statement where they emphasize this again, that the notwithstanding clause is expected to only be used in exceptional situations and only as a last resort after careful consideration. It's not designed to be used by government as a convenience or as a mean of circumventing proper processes. And so what I argue is beyond this normative political deterrence that there's been a lot of um, commentary and theories and discussion on, the drafters of the charter also embedded structural safeguards within the notwithstanding clause to ensure that it is only used in these rare use exceptional circumstances. And those, two, those safeguards that I identify both fall within the umbrella of democratic accountability um, that Jamie Cameron had spoken about. I think that other people will speak about it later today. And so I identify two branches of that democratic accountability safeguards, one of them being democratic accountability through the legislative process, and then the second being democratic accountability through the electoral processes. And so I draw on judicial review commentary from John Hart Ely, um, and also case law on minority rights within the Canadian constitutional democracy. 
Um, just for length of time for this presentation, I haven't included you know, quotes that I'll be referencing, but um, they, are, they will be in my paper um, that is the outcome of this. Um, for those who are unaware of John Hart Ely, he is an American legal scholar who is very critical of due process approaches to judicial, judicial review. And so due process approach to judicial review is that constitutional rights should only be um, protective of access to the vote. And it, they really are only supposed to be guaranteeing political equality and that the legislature will guarantee all other rights. And that's where, where these rights discussions should go. And John Hartley Ely is very critical of this by saying that minority, minority groups require more than a vote for their interests to be protected. And he underlines the shortcomings of the democratic processes in safeguarding the interests of minority groups. Um, and that's really what I, I build upon in um, my thesis. And so um, turning to the first umbrella safeguard, um, democratic accountability through the legislature. And this is really embedded within section 33, subsection one of the notwithstanding clause. And there's really three subparts. The first is that there must be an express declaration of rights that will be temporarily suspended. Um, and that requires some form of public notice. And I think Kahana speaks a little bit about this and some of the stuff that he's written about, um, where it supports visibility of the notwithstanding clause so that, so that both the legislature and the public can have these debates over um, or discussions if this is an appropriate use. Further, it has to be an act of parliament that's passed by a simple majority. It can't be passed by the executive. Um, you know, it's different than the Emergencies Act that can be used by the executive and then later um, they, they seek approval from the legislator. And then finally, um, there's also the legislative process with their significant consideration and uh, multi-steps multi and committee approaches. I think before getting into the conversation of minority rights, I think if you actually look at the history of the notwithstanding clause use in the Hansard, the democratic accountability through the legislature has not been as powerful as a limiting um, tool on the notwithstanding clause as I think people may think. Um, often, almost every time the notwithstanding clause has been proposed to be used, it's by a majority, a majority government. Um, and in many instances, there have, it has been passed within one or two days. In um, Quebec, when Bill 101, it was added in response to, to Ford. Um, there was actually no legislative debate on, on the issue. And so, um, moving just to the ways in which minority groups are uniquely vulnerable, um, within the legislative process, I, um, discuss how minority groups lack political representation statistically. And they're often not even a required voting block for re-election. There are countless examples throughout Canadian history of legislatively passed minority group discrimination. Um, the public who forms the majority could either be apathetic or actively support the targeting of minority groups through legislation. I would just say in reference to Bill 21, um, it was a, unlike in Ontario where um, the 2018 uh, intervention in the municipal election, that was not part of the election. That was not part of the campaigning. It was a surprise to many people. But for Bill 21 in Quebec, it was actually a campaign promise, not to use the notwithstanding clause, but that there would be um, a form of secularism that would um, impact religious minorities in the province. And the um, government was elected with a majority. Um, and then in polling after Bill 21 was introduced, it's actually a very popular policy. And it still is, is supported by at least um, in the polls that I looked at by a majority of the Quebec population. And then finally, um, the charter was entrenched in part as a response to a failure um, for members of democratic institutions to play that protective role for minority groups. Turning then to, oh, I think I went one too far. Okay, uh, and then my second argument is around democratic accountability through electoral processes. And these safeguards are really embedded within section 33 sub one and section 33 sub two. Um, and as has been already discussed in, in the conference, it's really that um, democratic rights do not fall under section, section 33 of the charter. Um, they cannot be subject to limitation. And then also the five year sunset clause was designed to cyclically um, increase the visibility of the notwithstanding clause every five years. And that aligns with the four year election requirement in the constitution. And so by creating this, the idea was that there will be political consequences, or there's the potential for political consequences if the notwithstanding clause is used in an inappropriate way, as some people say, might say a tyrannical way. Um, but my argument is that um, this, um, 
accountability through the electoral process is still um, under the assumption that the voting electorate is interested um, and um, supports the interests of minority groups, which we have seen within Canada um, was, was the challenges of the uh, pre-charter times. And so um, by definition, minority groups lack meaningful representation in the legislature, but also have minimal impact to the, the ballot box. Many minority groups face significant barriers to voting. This includes higher rates of poverty, poverty, lack of identification, and often, and in some cases, an inability to physically access voting stations. Minority groups um, with no ability to access, there are also minority groups who have no ability to access the ballot box. I use the example of non-citizens, such as refugees or permanent residents. I know Natalie yesterday spoke about children. Um, we've also at this conference spoken about how um, those who are incarcerated did not have the right to vote um, for quite a long time in Canadian history. And then my final point is that many issues related to minority groups may not be con may be considered controversial or unpopular to the majority at large. And for the final two um, points, I, I think of the Suresh case, where the Supreme Court heard um, from an individual who was not a Canadian citizen who was at risk of deportation, and he was being accused of terrorism right after 9/11 had happened. And if we were to put his interests uh, to the public at large at that time, you can almost you can foresee how that would have gone as opposed to being able to go through judicial review uh, through the Supreme Court to safeguard um, his interests, um, in this case under Section 7. And so just to conclude, um, I seek to contribute to the discussion on the role of the notwithstanding clause within Canada's constitutional democracy. If we're going to talk about how the notwithstanding clause is limited by um, elections by democratic accountability, we must also recognize the ways in which that is a limited tool for certain people, certain segments of our population. Um, I think that there needs to be a consideration where um, if these structural protections may create a situation whereby one of the only uses of the notwithstanding clause that does not incur significant political consequences is targeting of minority rights and that these, and I wonder what the repercussions of this is it, are in an age of rising populism. Some of my other work focuses more on judicial responses and interpretation of the notwithstanding clause, which was the focus of a panel yesterday, but I'm also happy to speak about that. And then finally, I just I seek to um, ask how our understanding of the embedded democratic accountability safeguards within the notwithstanding clause can impact our discussions of how we understand how the court should inter interpret the notwithstanding clause, how the notwithstanding clause should be reformed, and if it should be abolished. Um, thank you again. So much, Caitlin. That was really wonderful, and I'm sure there will be questions for you. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite Kara Zwiebel up. Uh, she'll join issue to some degree with uh, with Jamie's remarks yesterday. We're talking about uh, democratic accountability and reading Section 33 in a purposive way, uh, and putting a positive spin on what Section 33 might be able to do for democratic accountability. Should have worn slightly higher heels. <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you uh, to, to Peter and to Natalie for the invitation. And um, uh, I've really enjoyed the last uh, day and a half listening to um, these interesting and compelling ideas about uh, what I think is a really difficult constitutional subject. Um, so I'm going to start by admitting that uh, after hearing Professor Cameron's talk yesterday, I did raise with Peter the possibility that I had little, if anything, to contribute to the proceedings, but that I would do my best to try to approach the topic from a slightly different angle. Um, I do think my remarks will complement what we heard yesterday from Professor Cameron about the important relationship between the notwithstanding clause and the democratic rights that are excluded from its scope, particularly the right to vote. Uh, and my thesis is that we should understand Section 3 not only as encompassing a right to vote or a right to meaningful participation, as the court has said, but that it is better understood as a right to a fair and legitimate democratic process, recognizing that there's a lot packed into that phrase that we might want to take apart. <clears throat> 
Um, I also should disclose that I work at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and that we are also involved as an intervener in the working families litigation here in Ontario, which challenges Bill 307 related to, uh, to third party election advertising. So that is certainly one of the lenses through which I am considering the impact of Section 33. Um, and at the same time, CCLA is among the organizations that has challenged Quebec's Bill 21. Uh, and as a result, that particular law also helps to inform my views and indeed uh, my concerns about the circumstances in which the clause may be invoked. And of course, I'm here on my own behalf, not necessarily articulating CCLA positions on these issues. Uh, so with those caveats out of the way, I hope to do three things in the time that I have this morning. And I think since I'm the only thing standing between us and lunch, you'll be pleased to know that I probably won't take the full time that I'm allotted. Um, so first I wanna give you what I think is some important background about Bill 307, which helps to inform my position about the need for a particularly expansive understanding of Section 3. Um, then I want to discuss the notion of structural rights as described in the work of Professor Yasmin Dawood and in particular her view of democratic rights as being structural in nature. Um, and finally, I want to argue in line with what we heard from uh, Jamie yesterday that the exclusion of democratic rights from the scope of Section 33 combined with the five-year sunset provision in Section 33 sub 3 makes plain that democratic accountability is a core function of the clause. And my argument is not only that the exclusion of section three from section 33 should inform how we interpret the notwithstanding clause, but also that it calls for a particularly expansive understanding of the right to vote. Uh, so first some background on Bill 307 and the working families litigation. Uh, in Working Families versus Ontario, a group of unions and individuals under the banner of Working Families sought to challenge changes made to Ontario's Election Finances Act. Uh, now, this act was actually amended by the Liberal government in 2017, so that for the first time, third-party election advertising was subject to spending limits in a pre-writ period. Uh, and in uh, in the changes made by the Liberal government, it was a six month period leading up to the issuance of an election writ. Um, since many jurisdictions in Canada have adopted fixed election dates, there have been attempts to rejig spending rules so that they are not easily evaded in the lead up to the election period. Um, but the 2017 amendments didn't only alter the time period in which restrictions operated, it also amended the meaning of political advertising so that it included not only advertising with the purpose of promoting or opposing a party, candidate, or leader, but also any advertising that takes a position on an issue that can reasonably be regarded as closely associated with a party, leader, or candidate. So this extension to issue-based advertising um, significantly widens the scope of restricted political expression I would say it also significantly muddies the waters of what constitutes restricted political expression. And as we get further and further from the actual campaign period, it becomes harder and harder to determine which issues are closely associated with parties or candidates. So after these 2017 amendments came into effect, working families issued a notice of application and proceeded with the steps necessary to challenge the law. Uh, the government responded to the application with their own materials, including expert reports and affidavits that sought to justify the six month spending limit as necessary and reasonable to ensuring, quote, a fair and proper election process. And again, although we might each have different ideas about what a fair and proper election process looks like, I think that broadly stated objective is not a particularly controversial one. Um, so before the Working Families case made it to a hearing, the Conservative government introduced new amendments to the Election Finances Act in 2021. Uh, while Bill 254 maintained the same monetary limit on third party election advertising spending in the pre-writ period, the amendment doubled the period itself from six months to a year. So as a result, third parties were restricted in their spending on political ads, including issue-based ones, for an ent entire 12 months before a writ was dropped. 
Um, and I want to pause here to note that the BC Court of Appeal had twice previously struck down that province's pre-writ limits on th third party advertising. Um, once when it was 60 days prior to the start of the election and once when it was 40 days. So a year is um, exceptionally uh, anomalous. Um, it's also worth noting that while the bill placed more restrictions on third parties, it also doubled the allowable donations to political parties and increased the annual per vote funding for parties. And um, changes had also been made by the prior Liberal government to eliminate the Ontario Auditor General's power to review government ads and determine if they included partisan content. So when you put all of these elements together, uh, you find a major advantage to the incumbent governing party and a significant disadvantage to third party voices that may be critical of that government or may even just want to engage on some of the important issues of the day. Uh, and finally, the bill that uh, the Conservative government introduced received royal assent about a month before this pre year-long pre-writ period would have begun. Uh, so working families amended their application and challenged Bill 254 in court. Um, and Justice Morgan and, at Ontario Superior Court of Justice easily determined that there was a violation of Section 2B of the Charter uh, and that the violation was not justified under Section 1. Um, the case was in some ways an easy victory because the government's own evidence had initially indicated that a six-month period of restricted pre-writ activity was reasonable. Um, when they amended the law and it was challenged, they got some of their experts to swear additional affidavits that a 12-month period was also reasonable. <laughs> so um, this clearly self-serving evidence meant that the government could not credibly argue that its measures were the least restrictive ones necessary under Oaks. Um, and as the court noted, without meaning to stress the obvious, it is hard to see how 12 months is minimal if six months will do the trick. Um, so the court struck down the impugned provisions with immediate effect. Um, and as Jamie described yesterday, the Ontario government immediately announced its intention to reintroduce the changes while invoking Section 33, and, and that's what Bill 307 did. Uh, so Bill 307 was once again challenged by working families, this time on the grounds that it violated Section 3 of the Charter, um, and some of the parties also raised challenges to the, the use of the notwithstanding clause uh, in more general terms. Um, Justice Morgan once again heard the case at first instance, but this time found no violation of Section 3. Um, and the Court of Appeal will be hearing the appeal in June, shortly after the provincial election. So um, what we see happening with these various legislative changes is a government, in my view, that is altering the electoral rules of the game to their benefit. Uh, and in a 2012 piece in the University of Toronto Law Journal, Yasmin Dawood describes this partisan self-dealing as a central challenge for democratic governance. And she's not talking about the notwithstanding clause or uh, thinking in particular about cases where political expression in the electoral context is at issue. Um, she's looking more generally at how we should conceive of the democratic rights protections that we have in the charter. And she identifies their capacity to address the perennial problem of self-dealing. She notes that, quote, electoral rules that govern voting, political parties, electoral boundaries, apportionment, the administration of elections and campaign finance are often designed to achieve partisan objectives. By manipulating these rules, elected representatives stifle political competition, thereby reducing democratic accountability. So the argument is that judicial oversight of the democratic process should be used to limit partisan or incumbent self-entrenchment. Uh, and one way that Professor Dow would suggest doing this is to conceptualize democratic rights as structural in nature, which she describes as individual rights that take into account the broader institutional framework within which rights are defined, held, and exercised. So if we take the institutional framework into account, um, we, we may get to a place where the right to vote encompasses not only the right to cast a ballot or to participate meaningfully in an election, but also the right to a fair and legitimate democratic process. 
And I would also argue that this concern about partisan self-dealing in the electoral context militates in favor of a judicial approach to democratic rights cases that is less deferential to government. Uh, and in my view, the invocation of Section 33 wouldn't change that. And I think that the Supreme Court in some of the uh, more direct right to vote cases like Sove and Frank have recognized that, uh, that need to not defer. Um, but I think in some of the democratic rights cases that are a little bit more tangentially related to the right to vote, they've, they've been much more deferential. Uh, so how does the notwithstanding clause fit into all of this? Um, as Professor Cameron noted yesterday, there's a special relationship that exists between the clause and the democratic rights contained in sections three through five of the charter. And the five-year sunset clause included in section 33 was placed there precisely to ensure that a government that invoked the clause would have to be accountable to the electorate for doing so. But if a government is permitted to change the electoral rules of the game in a manner that would allow them to avoid accountability, then a core purpose of Section 33 is severely undermined. To take the most extreme example, suppose that in addition to its restrictions on third party election advertising, Bill 307 included a total prohibition of any discussion of the government's use of Section 33. This would clearly violate Section 2B, but given its impact on the ability of the electorate to hold the government accountable, I think there's a strong argument that democratic rights are directly engaged and that such a law could and should be struck down. So my hope is that all of this helps to justify a more expansive interpretation of what the right to vote or, or maybe the bundle of democratic rights more generally encompasses. Um, and in my view, it also makes a strong case for disallowing the use of Section 33 in any case where the purpose or effect of the legislation at issue is to appreciably impact our democratic structures. Uh, now, I know that this panel is about substantive equality and minority rights, and I've not really talk, touched on those topics. Um, they aren't the focus of my remarks, but I do think there is potential for a more expansive understanding of our democratic rights to better protect minority interests. Um, yesterday, Professor Newman described the carve-outs from Section 33 as protecting rights of voice and rights of exit. And in my view, legislation that touches on those rights of voice cannot and should not be touched by Section 33. Um, I agree with what, what Caitlin said. Our democratic structures don't always work in a way that amplifies the voices that are otherwise silenced. But surely allowing governments to manipulate the rules for their own benefit is not what was intended by excluding these rights from the scope of the notwithstanding clause. So I would argue we need to give our democratic rights a generous interpretation and that doing so enhances not only the breadth of those rights but helps to support Section 33 in doing its democratic accountability work. Thank you. Caitlin should come up. That was fabulous, and I think Jamie will agree that you added a great deal today, and it was by no means just retracing her steps. Some really important observations, and I know, I hope we're going to have some great questions. Let me just uh, kick it off by asking, if I understand correctly, I mean, you want uh, to disallow the use of Section 33 under certain conditions. I'm all in favor of, of that and particularly conditions in which the uses of uh, Section 33, as you put it, touch on the rights of voice, okay? Uh, I guess when I combine that with your, uh, your view, and I think it was Jamie's as well, and because Jamie talks a, a great deal about uh, meaningful participation, meaningful participation in the political process. Um, Again, what is the content of that term meaning? It sounds like both of you want Section 33 to do a lot of the heavy lifting that Section 2B was meant to do. And I can't get my head around, and oh, so J Jamie's nodding, and well, I hope we'll, we'll hear from you in, this, in, this, uh, in response to what I'm saying, because I can't see logically how, you know, it's kind of a zero-sum game. I mean, either Section 2B is doing that heavy lifting of political expression, and, uh, and Section 3 is, you know, has a formalistic function in relation to elections specifically, and even more particularly elections that concern provincial and federal uh, mandates. Um, if, it's, if I'm wrong about this, then exactly who is it that's going to do the disallowing? What's the mechanism to achieve the disallowance? 
of Section 33 in those circumstances. I, and, I, and I presume you're not referring to constitutional amendment or no. you know, changing the rules of the operating no. instructions. And Jamie, you may want to weigh in as well. Please. I mean, I, I think what I mean by disallowing is that, um, for example, the Court of Appeal, when it hears the Working Families case, would interpret no. Section 3 uh, in a way that that recognizes that what's what's happening with this legislation is that it's it's undermining um, the integrity of the democratic sort of structure. So, and I, I know that I, I think Jamie talked yesterday about sort of um, this affects the interpretation of Section 3 always, but maybe particularly in cases where the notwithstanding clause has been invoked. And I mean, the fact is, right, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need it if the, if the notwithstanding clause hadn't been invoked, because I agree, the, the more obvious place that it lives is under Section 2B. Um, but I think it's because we, we have a government that, um, that, that doesn't see, not only does it not see sort of the, the electoral or democratic sphere as a, a no-go zone when it comes to the notwithstanding clause, um, I mean, it, it sees it in a very cavalier way that requires basically no debate and um, you know, no meaningful discussion. Um, so I, I think that, that that's how you do it, that it, it does mean expanding what Section 3 includes in that, this case and potentially in, in any case. And that's problematic after Justice Morgan's decision, right? Yeah. I mean, um, I, uh, what, what do you say to Justice Morgan? That he was wrong, period? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, frankly, I, I, um, I, I guess I could say that I think, I mean, I think Justice Morgan was right in his first decision on working families, but I think there was a lot more that could have been said in that decision also sure. about the, the scope of rights. I don't think it was the, um, you know, I, I got where it needed to go, but I, I certainly think there was a lot more work that could have been done. And, and I think in, in the second iteration of Working Families, the discussion of, of, of what the right to vote includes is, is a very a formalistic and superficial one. Okay, great. I know Robert and Guillaume uh, have questions. I just would like Jamie maybe to take the first crack at asking or responding or both. First, I want to thank Kara for going carefully over Bill 307 and 254, uh, because it's important to understand the background, and I kind of brushed over it all carelessly yesterday. But um, just on the questions that you raise, uh, Peter, uh, you know, you said something about Section 3 doing the heavy lifting of Section 2B, and I guess I, w I wouldn't really agree with that. I think that the key changeover from uh, working families number one to working families number two is understanding that it's a different charter guarantee that is at stake right. and it's completely different well I shouldn't say completely different but it's a different set of considerations so it's a shift from focusing on the rights of section 2b speakers which was working families number one mm -hmm. to the rights of voters and the effect on the rights of voters of placing severe restrictions on those third party uh, speakers under section 2b and so um, I, I don't even see it as requiring an expansion yeah. of Section 3. I just see it as more requiring uh, an extrication of what's understood about Section 3 from Section 2B ah. and an understanding of what is at stake under Section 3, which, uh, you know, in the go-to case, I think, is really Figueroa, which, re which yeah. is um, quite an interesting case for the way it interpreted Section 3 expansively. We don't need anything else because... It uh, includes not only the bare right to vote, but also the right of meaningful participation and right. the right of access to information that can that might influence the vote. Um, and so that's the really key part about Bill 307 by uh, by uh, quashing uh, so much of the pre-election electoral discourse through these restrictions. I mean, I think it. I'm, well, I'm converted, obviously, but it clearly undermines a voter's right of access to information oh, that could make a difference. Yeah, and the courts just have to get that point yeah. under Section 3 rather than uh, continue to uh, conflate Section 2B and Section 3 and retain their focus on the right. rights of okay. the union speakers, which is, uh, I think, one of the issues I have with 
Justice Morgan's decision okay. in Working Families too, because okay. he brought the egalitarian model from Libman and Harper versus Canada right into the definition of the right to vote under Section 3. And that's a, that's a doctrinal boo-boo. Anyway, I'll stop, but I did just want to um, raise a little question for Caitlin, which I thought the presentation was fantastic. Oh, yeah. I just had a little question about um, minority group vulnerability, which I think is inherent in the structure of the override. So it would be an at-risk issue from the very beginning. But I just wonder if you have any sense of how that has changed over time, over the 40 years, whether it's kind of a constant. You spoke of targeting and rising populism. And I just wondered whether you had some sense of whether there's been any shift in that dynamic of the override that we should be particularly concerned about at this point in time. So thank you. Sorry, I spoke so much. Great. Thank you very much for the question. Um, just to also say, my PhD thesis, I focus on what both of you have argued, and I'm very much in support, so I think it's really wonderful. Um, in terms of the shifting use of the notwithstanding clause, I would tentatively argue that there is a shift in how it is being used since 2018. We're a bit too early to, to say that conclusively. Um, but in terms of a lot of the rhetoric that is being used, um, you know, when Doug Ford invoked it in 2018 for the municipal election, that wasn't targeting minority rights, but he said, you know, I might use this as much as I want, um, something along those lines. And um, initially, um, in the first decade, it really was very much focused on national identity um, and language rights, um, and also like labor um, rights as well. However, um, more recently, we're seeing um, it being used. Um, you know, we talk about um, minorities and you know the sense of identities, but also, for example, in New Brunswick, it was used against a minority population of anti-boxers. And so, I do foresee, um, you know, with. Quebec and with Ontario, we're seeing this rise in populism, and it might become increasingly used. Great. Natalie, we have to make a note that after our Section 1 conference, we'll do another one on Section 3. <laughs> I think that's critical. Robert, you have a question. I think it's really for Kara. So we're in a moment, Section 33 is being used more. The Supreme Court is backing away from using unwritten constitutional principles. So I think it's, it's natural to be looking harder at the parts of the Charter that are not amenable to Section 33. And you, you've been looking clearly, you know, 345, and you mentioned Dwight had spoken about rights of voice and rights of exit. But of course, Section 23 is there as well. So I wondered if to really work with it, and, and you know, there's lots that can be done. You can sort of say unwritten principles are going to be less present, but there's still obviously text sort of has certain kind of logically necessary things. And so there's lots of work to be done drawing out what, what text requires. But have you th sort of thought through what's the explanation for the story that has those voice and exit pieces, but also section 23? Is it a sort of federalism spine or structure? Like it's, it's less compelling, of course, if you just have a sense that there's like several rights here and then one over on the other side, right? Yeah, um, thanks. I, I think the answer is I've not thought about it sufficiently to, to be able to answer that question well. Um, I mean, I, I do think that there's, like to a certain extent, some of this is a bit, I guess, a bit new because we're litigating these issues around the notwithstanding clause and uh, and, and looking for the, the gaps where, where it might, um, where we might be able to, to, to pull things out of its scope. Um, but I don't, I don't think I have a, a good theory of, of, you know, of how to do that. I do think that the, um, the, the unwritten constitutional principles, to the extent that they can help um, you know, inform the interpretation of the text, um, I, th I think there is this idea, at least with respect to section three, that um, the unwritten principle of democracy um, does include this kind of, uh, I think in uh, Michael Powell has talked about it as sort of the, a thin conception of, of democracy in terms of the, the process and the structures. And I think that's in line with um, the, the kind of argument that I was trying to make, but I don't think I have a satisfactory answer to the, to the section 23 piece yet. I'm, I'm just, uh, 
I, I've told some of you, I've just recently taken over management of uh, the, the Bill 21 file at CCLA from one of my colleagues. Um, so I'm still getting up to speed on all the ins and outs of that of that case and how um, how some of those fit in, including um, you know including Section 28. Um, I, I, I want to think more about what um, what Section 28, what role it has, um, you know, in some of these cases. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. I have a question on an uh, issue that was mentioned by uh, Ms. Salvino, but it was also mentioned, I think, this morning by Jonathan, maybe by Marianne as well, and yesterday uh, one or two uh, person mentioned it as well, is the issue of populism. Uh, if you look at the literature on constitutional populism, so basically populist government to modify constitution, uh, the problem with constitutional populism is that it doesn't respect minority, minorities' rights and it limits counter powers, such as the media, but also uh, the judicial power. Uh, and the example are usually Poland and Hungary. So I guess my question is, do you see a link between the use of the notwithstanding clause in Quebec and Bill 21, Bill 96, and populism in general, and more precisely, constitutional populism? And I know it's quite a hard question, so I guess I'll give you my answer, and then you can, <laughs> and then you can uh, comment my answer and or give your answer. So my answer would be that there is no link because, because the, na the National Assembly actually represents a minority, which is not the case of the Polish and Hungarian Parliament, as far as, as I know. And then for the other issue, the, the counter power of the, the judicial power, the way I see it is that in a federation, the real power with a big P is the federal parliament, the federal government, and the Supreme Court appointed by the federal government. And in a federation, the provincial legislature, their counter power in, uh, in front of that big power that is the federal state. So having that in mind, I would say that using the notwithstanding clause actually reinforce the counter power that is the National Assembly in the broader uh, federation framework. And therefore, the use of the notwithstanding clause in Bill 21 and 96 is not populist. But that's my take, and I would like to hear yours or anybody, because I know that many of you mentioned populism uh, this morning or yesterday. Well, Thanks. Sorry. I think you'll have a no, no, go, go, go ahead. Um. I will not say that I'm a populism expert. My um, graduate work was in law, not politics. Um, but I guess in response to the first point, um, I don't view populism as uh, zero sum, um, that you're either a populist government or you're not. You're either not populist or you're Poland. Um, I think that there can be right. a spectrum of populism. And um, we can have populist governments in Canada that are adopting um, factors or elements of populism um, without going you know, full, full um, you know, I guess Poland, to use your example. <laughs> um, and then uh, in response to the second um, comment, I think that in the case of Quebec, when we talk about minority rights, it is extremely complex because Quebec is a minority or French language um, speakers are a minority federally, but provincially they are not. And so when we're talking about minority rights within the context of, within the division powers, within um, Quebec's authority, um, that's really, I guess what I was speaking about in terms of the vulnerability within the legislative process, which um, I, I said that there are shortcomings even within that. That's great, Marion. Uh, on, on, on populism, uh, Guillaume, I don't think we should be conflating populism with illiberalism. Uh, not to say that they don't intersect and overlap, but you know, you, the examples you cited are fundamentally illiberal regimes that are now, in, in Hungary's case, bordering on uh, autocracies uh, w within a constitutional, a constitutional demo democratic framework, but absolutely not, uh, not, not uh, you know, sort of uh, identical <coughs> to populist regimes per se, and I, I certainly adopt your answer about, uh, about the, the point that populist regimes don't necessarily um, um, ignore the interests and the rights uh, of, of minorities. Marion. 
I'm, I'm not going to address that last comment or question. I want to I want to switch back actually uh, to to Robert's question to the panel because um, it's something I've noticed is happening. And actually, full credit to Robert, he wrote about this uh, two year two or three years ago, um, saying that w when we see this uh, increased use of the notwithstanding clause, we may also see. Uh, among other things, uh, litigation based on the rights that are not subject to the notwithstanding clause. And um, and I think we're seeing that in both Quebec and Ontario right now uh, with the Bill 21 litigation. Of course, my personal involvement does have to do with the Section 23 rights. Um, and I see this happening now with the litigation in Ontario, which I wasn't aware of, where we see a, 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 you know an attempt to, to, to put more into Section 3. Um, and, and so it does beg the question, theoretically, how do we theorize this in the Canada's constitution? What do those, what do mobility, democratic, and language rights actually have in common? Um, and just to plug, I, I, I've been thinking about this too, and I, I've got a draft paper about it. Yeah. Um, and um, and it's actually inspired by uh, some of the work of Benoit Peltier and this idea that uh, the, the notwithstanding clause does protect the diversity of provinces and putting a federalism law, federalism lens onto that, it's very particularly Canadian, the ambit of section 33, what's included and what's not. Anyway, I, I'd love to talk to you about it over lunch, but I just wanted to link it up. That That is the common thread happening in Ontario and Quebec right now. It's more of a comment than a question, but thanks. Did, did any of you want to respond to that or comment? Just thanks. <laughs> David. Um, I'm not sure that I would draw such a rigid line between um, Populist Act in Poland and Hungary and Populist Act in North America. Um, sometimes legislation that overrides certain cultural practices, and I'm using that in quotation marks deliberately, um, are basically you know red meat to, um, to majoritarian groups that are part of the governing coalition of existing governments. Um, so I'm not sure, if we're going to talk about constitutional populism, or we're going to talk about populism, I'm not sure that you can say just because Poland and Hungary are authoritarian um, that its populism is somehow uh, a, a separate category. Um, sometimes legislation is done to signal to, um, to majorities that we're with you um, to pick on groups that really can't organize effectively uh, in defense of their their own um, their own community. Um, Caitlin, when you look at minority groups, are you looking at them in the co European concept where they're largely uh, homogenous religiously, homogenous culturally? Because um, for many minority groups, they look more like the Aboriginal community in Canada. We talk about it as a community, but it is a community of communities. I'm from the West Indies. There is no single religious um, group. Um, people are multiracial. They're multicultural. If we were to even use our numbers to advocate for ourselves, we wouldn't have the same capacity as other minority groups, particularly European minority groups that are more, more homogenous. So that's something to be considered in your discussion of the ability of minority groups to represent <coughs> themselves on um, vis-a-vis legislation. I just have one, one comment, not a full response, but this was something that came up um, when I was defending my master's thesis was, um, are women a minority group? You know, do we consider that as part of that? Because even though 50% um, uh, in theory, uh, the Canadian population um, self-identifies as female. Um, they continue to face many of the same challenges that I discussed in my thesis, and um, that's something that um, I'm still grappling with. And how do we define minority groups um, in, in these contexts? And uh, uh, I don't talk about Indigenous groups in Canada um, primarily because um, a lot of their their rights are not subject to uh, uh, at least Section 35 is not subject to the um, notwithstanding clause. Let, let me just. 10 second response to your, your, your comment uh, about populism, David. I was simply trying to distinguish or underscore the distinction between constitutional and institutional architecture, if you will, uh, on the one hand, and public sensibility and political movements and trends on the other. I mean, populism is not a system. Uh, it's a phenomenon, and it's a complex issue. We don't, can't get into it here. That's for another conference. But uh, <laughs> that, that was the point. Uh, that was actually, to some degree, the, 
subject that we talked about a fair bit in the last conference we did. But um, so that's what I really meant to say is that they're apples and oranges. It's not a question, you know, and, it, and it may well just, be that I was making a point, Peter. So yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. I wasn't really being critical. Yeah. And we may, we may hear something about this from Sabrina in her talk this afternoon. I'm not sure. Uh, she may decide to go there. Um, other questions or comments before we break for lunch? Yes, sir. Lunch is ready or not. Ask a question if they're not ready for it. No, no, please. Ask your question. It's always fruitful when you stand up. No question. Well, sometimes, perhaps. Um, I mean, this is something that I'm, this is, I guess, for Cara and Jamie. Um, I assume these are the kinds of arguments that are being made on the other side, and I'm just kind of curious what your response is. I mean, one, one argument is going to be, well, we have Section 2B, and we have Section 3, so they each have their domain, and therefore, there isn't a reason to interpret. Now, we can't, we shouldn't be interpreting Section 3 in light of Section 33, because it has a function. It has a function in relation to, uh, you know, Section 2, to b and I guess the other argument is the more practical argument, and that is, you know, we're all familiar with the standard arguments in support of freedom of expression, and one of the central arguments is that it's essential to the operation of a democratic form of government. That's understood in a variety of different ways, as we know, but one of the challenges for those who make that their focus has been to define the scope of what is democratic speech, or speech that is vital or important to the democratic process. So you have somebody like Robert Post, who makes an argument about public discourse and a fairly broad understanding of it, and you have narrower views of it. So that's also something to contend with once you want to say Section 3 encompasses something to do with democratic speech. Are you going to confine it specifically to the electoral process, or is it going to be broader than that? So that's, I'm curious. Um, yeah, I guess I think that, um I mean, on the, the sort of, you know, that there, there's, there's two rights and they should each kind of do their own work. I, I mean, I think there's lots of pieces of the charter where rights have, where there's overlap. And, um, and, and I would put 2B in section three in that, you know, in that category that there's some shared, I don't know, shared <clears throat> real estate, I guess, um, in, in what they do. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the questions about what, you know, what is captured in kind of democratic expression and really like in the working families case more more about you know what limits on participation are reasonable or not are going to be highly contested and and I, I think like we have different we might have different ideas about about you know what's appropriate like I said the the working families the, the, the first version of the working families case was in some ways easy because the government I think sort of got greedy. I mean, they had a six month period that was being challenged. They wanted more, so they took more, uh, but they had all this evidence that sort of indicated that six months was sufficient. So um, so it was, it was an easy case for the court to decide. The court, to me, six months is still much too long, and, and the analysis that the court did around, um, around the, the pre-writ restrictions on political advertising was not um, not as protective of, of democratic expression as I would would have liked it to be um, you know I, I and I don't I don't say that there should be no limits on on what parties or third parties can do in the lead-up to an election um, but but I don't think it um, I don't think it put the government to you know to the proof of sort of establishing that these that, that, that there was any evidence that this was something that was necessary or effective. Um, and I guess that's maybe the, the piece that I'm more focused on is, is the, the court's task in, in forcing the government to, to put forward that justification, which I think is even more important in cases where, where the rules are changed you know, for, their own, for their own benefit. Um, but I'm not sure if I've totally answered your question, but maybe Jamie wants to take a step. <laughs> okay, well, with that, I want to thank this panel for a wonderful, wonderful presentations and a stimulating discussion. And thank you for your wonderful questions and comments. We're going to adjourn now for lunch, and we'll be back here at 2.30.
2 o'clock, is that right? Yeah. We're starting at 2.